morning, church. Good morning. How are you guys doing this fine and lovely day? Good, I hope. We have some rain finally. And as typical this past year, it's either no rain or gully washes. Who else had some flooding in their yard? I know that we had one member who had a roof problem and all that kind of stuff. And I'll tell you what, we're always a feature fan, right? Do we have any announcements? Yes? Just a reminder of the combined service at the park next Sunday at 10 30, and it's a potluck followed by a potluck and we're a peanut sing along. So, so that's next Sunday. 10.30 over at Fireman's Park, so if you come here and it's empty, get your butt up to the Fireman's Park. We'll try to have it marked. Yes. And it's, shared, it's a shared worship that we um, often do every fifth Sunday with Bristol, so it'll be a good time. Our fellowship, uh, Pastor Bob will be uh, leading worship with guitar and having that sing along afterwards, so it'll be a great time. So I'm really looking forward to that. Speaking of Pastor Bob, he is going to start his Bible study again. He'll be doing the Tuesdays of the month. First one here will be October 1st. Rich Young Ruler is one of his favorites. So that's what he'll be dealing with for the Bible study. Some of his favorite verses that he's going to dig into as well. And Mary Kay, you have a Bible study? Yes, Tuesdays. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one right God, who is eager to forgive and who loved us beyond our days. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you, Lord. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow in the fullness of Jesus Christ. Our Savior and Lord. Let us confess our sins. Most merciful God.
for it be what I committed my cause. This is the word of the Lord.
Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. And this is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, Jesus, our Savior, the Holy Spirit, our Counselor, one God, now and forever. Amen. So last week, Peter claimed that Jesus is the Messiah. He kind of misunderstood what that meant. Peter, and I'm sure the rest of the disciples, expected the Messiah to be a conquering hero, putting God's chosen people as rulers of the land and in positions of honor and greatness. But Jesus instead teaches them that the Messiah must be the servant of all, even if it means of death. In our gospel today, Jesus redefines what greatness means. And the disciples, as well as many today, can find it kind of hard to understand. Jesus gathers his disciples and tells them for the second time what will happen when he goes to Jerusalem, saying he's going to be betrayed and killed, and three days later he will rise again. But his disciples, their heads were spinning betrayal, death, rising from the grave. I'm thinking that this must have been too much for them. And as soon as they hit the road again, they started arguing with one another. Who among them was the greatest? What is greatness? Is it being the very best at something? You get any two football sport analysis or super fans together, and it won't be long before someone will start arguing who the best quarterback is, who's the GOAT, the greatest of all times. Is it Tom Brady? Joe Montana, Patrick Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers, or perhaps Jordan Love, will he be the greatest running down the road? No one knows, right? Ask dozens of people who, what greatness means, and you will probably get 12 different answers. The disciples are arguing about who is the greatest. Perhaps they were boasting about which of them spent the most time with Jesus? Which one amongst them did the most work? Or perhaps who was Jesus' favorite? Or maybe they were worried about a very terrifying reality. If Jesus dies, they will be left without a leader. And who among them are going to have the strength and the power to lead Jesus' disciples, once Jesus is gone, which one of them is going to take the place of Jesus? I might argue about that too. But either way, they have trouble understanding what Jesus was teaching. But are we any different? We have been taught as Christ followers that greatness comes from loving God, loving our neighbor, sharing what we have with those in need, seeking justice and mercy and forgiving as we have been forgiven. This is what it means to be a Christian. Yet how often do we define greatness in different terms? How often do we compare ourselves to others, trying to outdo them in unhealthy ways? How often do we try to impress others with the cars we drive or the house we live in, the clothes we wear, or how much better we are than someone else. And even how good we are when we come to church. We're good church folk, right? You are all here today. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with having nice stuff, or working hard, or being competitive, or really being very good at something. These are all good things. And of course, there's certainly nothing wrong with coming to worship. I hope you get to every Sunday. But it's how we prioritize these things that become important. When we put our greatness over and above the health and wholeness of someone else, this is where sin loves to live. When Jesus asked his disciples what they are arguing about on the road, they were quiet. They knew they crossed the line. I don't know if they even knew what that line was. Jesus 
doesn't condemn or shame them. I love that part. Instead, he gathers them together, you know. Come here, come here, guys. And he sits down. And remember, sitting down is a posture that the Jewish rabbi would take when he's teaching. That's why Pastor Bob often sits down right down in front when he's preaching. And Jesus begins to teach and define the true nature of greatness, saying, if anyone who wants to be first, they must be last, and they must be servants of all. How many struggle with this first, last thing? It's easy to say, and not easy to do. I mean, the only time I usually hear someone say that is when they cut in line or take the last donut, the first shall be last, the last shall be first, ha, ha, ha. But there's an expression that I'm sure a lot of you have heard of before called bottom of the totem pole. A totem pole, I'm sure you know, is that tall wooden pole carved with figures of sacred animals, important people, family lineage, fables, or history of the tribes. But when we use the term bottom of the totem pole, it means everyone is above you. You are not very important compared to those on top, and getting to the top means climbing over those ahead of you. But I found this inter interesting when I did a little research on totem poles. Many of the indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest, the lowest figure of the totem pole is actually the most important. The bottom of the pole is the thickest and most substantial part of the pole. It carries all the weight of everything above them. The figures carved at eye level, that's the important people. Those are the ones you connect with, not the ones way up there. So that familiar saying, bottom of the totem pole is actually flipped upside down. The bottom figure is, isn't, isn't the least important. It carries the most significant. Now, of course, Jesus did have a totem pole to make his point, but he did have an unusual illustration. So he picks up this little child, and he puts it in his arms, and he plops him right smack dab in the middle of those disciples. And he said, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. And this act of putting a child in this place of honor was very cultural at the time. In Jesus' times, children were loved, of course, but they had no status and no rights, and certainly had nothing to offer in terms of honor or greatness. They were, as we might say, in our understanding, the bottom of the totem pole. But Jesus used this child as this metaphor for what the kingdom of God should look like. Anyone like this child who is dependent on the care of others, anyone on the margins, anyone who is vulnerable, anyone who is in need of love or justice and hope, they have the place of honor in the kingdom. Those are the people we should be seeking to be great with. Because it's not about who is the greatest and can use their power to control others. It's about seeing the greatness in everyone you meet. Because as children of God, you all have value. Because Christ claims you in your baptism, in your faith, you have value, and nobody can take that away. And when we can welcome people who look, love, and act, or lead differently than we do into our lives, we welcome Jesus. Every time, every time we love, there is Jesus. And Jesus tells us when we welcome like that, there is God's Father. And we also know that the Holy Spirit drawing us to do those kinds of things. Good places to be. Our greatness on Jesus' terms can be challenging. But as Jesus teaches repeatedly, often, 
his way of greatness, this idea of love and mercy and hope, this is the path of great love, the path of a great life. So when I think of greatness, in this light, my mind goes to those teachers who are underpaid and often undervalued, who inspire and educate the future of our generations because they're called to do so. Or health workers who care for the sick and injured and oftentimes get sick themselves because they're around sick people. But they do it because they're called to do so. Or our police and firemen and first responders who risk their lives to protect and love their communities. They do this because they're called to. Volunteers who dedicate their lives to helping others. Those who give generously without asking to be acknowledged or to get anything in return. These people are great. Doing things for people who can't pay us back may not give us worldly success or a ton of money. It probably won't give us those things. But doing them for the sake of Christ in the name of love without expectations is a true mark of what Jesus is saying is great. And I think this is the kind of greatness that gives hope to our world. When we act this way, when love comes first over hate, greatness. I think that makes God smile. So let your light shine before others that they'll see your good works and give glory to God in heaven. And all God's people said, Please rise if you are able as we sing our hymn of the day.
Drawn together in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray with confidence for the Church, God's good creation, and all who are in need. Loving God, you welcome all at your table of grace. You'll instill in your Church a spirit of humility and curiosity that we embrace all who seek you. We pray especially for ministries of hospitality and faith formation. Hear us, O God. Creating God, you shape the world so there's more than enough for all. Curb our habits of overuse and guide us toward more sustainable <coughs> sources of energy, food, and water. Hear us, O oh God. Gracious God, your peace brings justice and solidarity. Encourage peace among all peoples, tribes, and nations. Heal divisions in our country and local communities, that together we might cooperate for the good of all. Hear us, O oh God. <coughs> Faithful God, you draw near to all who are in need. Bring healing and wholeness to all who suffer. Transform economic, political, and social systems that oppress vulnerable people, especially systems of structural race and generational poverty. Hear us, O God. Transforming God, you accompany all through changes and transitions. Help us to see where you are calling this community to new ways of living the gospel promise. Assure us that even as change brings loss, it also brings hope and life. Hear us, O God. Merciful God, you embrace us on our final pilgrimage from this life. Accompany all who have died, console those who mourn, and at the last, show us the way to eternal life in you. Hear us, O oh God. We entrust these and all our prayers to you, Holy God, in the name of your beloved child, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with you. Love and response to Christ's grace and forgiveness and salvation. We give of our whole selves, our time, and our resources to serve all that God has.
bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. And the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord. It is indeed our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so all the choirs of angels, with the church honor and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join our in any
Go in peace with Christ beside you.